So welcome back to Everything Marketplaces, where we talk with founders and leaders from some of today's top marketplaces. So this is episode 154, which is a really great group chat that we just had with Rad Mobram, who's a founder and CEO of Intro. So Intro is a marketplace that makes it easy for people to book some of the most in-demand experts for personalized advice through one-to-one -one video calls. Intro is also backed by top investors like 776 and A16Z. So this was a really great chat with Rad, where we got to learn more about what some of his key learnings were from his previous experience starting Lettuce, the founding story for Intro, what the first steps were that they took to start as a marketplace, how they solved for early challenges like the cold start problem, did an overview of it as a leading marketplace for booking one-on-one -on -one video calls with experts today, got to learn more about their recent growth, what the fundraising journey has been like raising from top investors like A16Z, and also had a really great group Q&A. So really enjoyed this conversation, and you're going to find it a great watch to the end. So, Rad, you've been a uh, highly requested uh, group chat guest for a while now, so I'm uh, really excited to have you join us here today, and we'd like to start off by saying a huge thanks for taking the time to do so in advance. So before we really dive into things with the uh, intro as a marketplace, I think it might be great if you can set off by briefly sharing your background for those that might not know you. Very cool, Wall. Thanks for having me. So, uh... My background, I tech entrepreneur. I, uh, I, 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 you know, I've started a couple companies now or a few companies. Uh, my last company, we built an operating system for small businesses. And then long story short, that company ended up getting acquired by Intuit. And then that was transformed into the new QuickBooks Online. Um, and then I got to run QuickBooks Online while I was there. Um, and it was a really cool opportunity. It was 27 at the time. So that was pretty crazy. Um, couldn't believe they, they kind of handed the king, the, the keys of the kingdom, but, uh, we, you know, we, we got the new QuickBooks online launched and, and now it's, it's, I think it's used by like 9 million businesses globally, which, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. Um, and then after into it, I, I took some time off. I did some angel investing. Um, and I learned that. Through that, I, I wanted to be an entrepreneur again. It's just who I am, and it's in my blood. And uh, and and so I, I always had this idea for for uh, uh, you know making it easy for for folks to get access to certain certain you know top experts or top you know successful people in in, in their industries to be able to learn from them and get guidance from them. Um, uh, but I, I didn't feel like the timing was right. And then the pandemic happened, and and as a result of that, we all became really comfortable with this concept of video calls, which is what we're doing right now. Um, I mean, in the matter of like two weeks, so it was a massive behavioral shift. And that idea I always wanted to do kind of kind of started to peel a lot more. So so uh, we started working on that, and that became intro. And and uh, for folks who don't know what intro is. Um, Intro is the best way to book the world's most in-demand experts. So you can jump on a live video call with them and get personalized advice. And so in our business category, for example, you can book the founder of Zillow or Reddit or OfferUp or Sweetgreen or Drybar, you name it. Um, and and hundreds, actually thousands, thousands more now. So so we have a lot of amazing folks on there that that you can now get access to and and uh, we we've been around for a little over two years now, and and we're now starting to see some of the success stories that are coming out, and it's it's just been the coolest company I've ever worked on by far, um, ten times cooler than QuickBooks, and and uh, and the impact that we're having has just been like I, we can't all help but internally we can't all help but feel just incredibly grateful for for what's what's been going on in the background with Intro and. And how we're we're helping change some lives, so that's it's pretty cool. So yeah, no, that's a really great uh, background. You know, thanks for uh, sharing with us. And uh, a lot we're going to get into here with our intro, and I'm uh, really excited about. But you know, going back to uh, to lettuce, which was a uh, early win, and a you know, big congrats on that, by the way. You know, what do you think some of your uh, key learnings were um, that you've uh, taken with you? You know, from your time there, and uh, maybe even uh, into it to now uh, intro. Some of my key learnings. Um, well, with, with lettuce. I, I really didn't know what I was doing back then. So, <laughs> so we were, we were, you know, we started off by throwing spaghetti against the wall and then, and then, uh, you do that enough times, something sticks. And then we, we then were able to raise some capital and that helped because that, 
improved our network and we got access to a lot more people and they started teaching us about funnels and customer acquisition costs and lifetime value and and so forth and and um and then just marketing tactics and and how to think about growth and um i i i think one thing that really stuck for me was was back in the day when i when i first met josh elman um who who's kind of like a growth legend um in silicon valley and he was at, at great log ventures i believe at the time he he taught me about how can you make your product uh, a type of product where as people are using it, they're they're also sharing it with their network. Um, and that just really stuck with me. And he, and he said how, uh, you know, those tend to be viral, much more viral, have a viral coefficient. And, and then uh, also how to think about products that have network effects and so forth. So, so um, with Lettuce, you know, it started off as a, as basically a tool to to manage inventory um but by the end of it it was it, it, it became like a supercharged accounting product for the most part so we we looked at um we looked at a typical wholesale or e-commerce or retail business and we we wanted to understand what was the challenges that they were facing in the back office so just to give you guys a sense of this if you're a wholesaler you get an order from somebody from a retail retail shop and then what happens is usually that's faxed over to you um and it's still actually not that different today to be honest like unless you have some sort of you know technological solution for it. but for the most for the most part you get faxed over an order or you get emailed over an order <clears throat> and then you got to take that data and you got to input it into your crm system you got to input it into your accounting system you got to input it into um, your, your inventory system, if you have one, uh, which most people don't, then you have to figure out which products go in, into which box. You got to go weigh it. You got to go take their information again, plug it into UPS or FedEx. Um, when you get the, get the whole shipping label and the cost of it, go back to your accounting, uh, system, put the, the shipping price on the invoice send the invoice out to folks, ship the products out, wait to get paid. Sometimes you don't get paid. And, and it's just like a very long, kind of like 45 minute process for wholesale orders for e-commerce orders. It's a bit more efficient, but then the inventory system and plugging things into your, into your CRM back in the day, this was in, you know, this is a little bit more automated now, but back in the day it was still quite tedious. So that was more like a 10 minute process. And so with, with lettuce, we connected all these different systems together so that you, you really had one single entry point of data and it would just transfer, uh, transfer that data to the respective, um, integrated solutions. And then ultimately what it would end up doing is, is it just took that 15 to 45 minute or 10 to 45 minute process and turn it into seconds. And I would tell you which products would go into which box, et cetera. Um, and to properly integrate with all of these different solutions, you kind of had to build enough functionality um, so that it would work with them. Um, so, you know, to work with QuickBooks Desktop, we had to build, you know, invoicing, we had to build sales orders, we had to build uh, uh, vendor management. So like, you know, purchase orders and bills and, um, uh, uh, and so forth. And, um, and, uh, and so we built this whole thing and, and the thing that really unlocked for us, like that was just kind of like an eye opening experience was when we built, um, we, we noticed that all of the online orders were really efficient, but all the wholesale orders were really inefficient still. Like it, 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 it was still too much of a challenge because of the first part, which is they were getting faxed these orders. Um, and they, the, their teams, uh, who were using our product still had to input that that data into that system. And so what we decided was let's build a B2B like wholesale product, um, as well so that every one of these wholesalers who have a thousand retail customers or 5,000 retail customers or 10,000 retail customers can invite those folks so that they can see all their products digitally place orders because they already have an account and all the data is already in there and, and place an order in the matter of seconds. Uh, or minutes and then all that data would just get pushed through to all the different systems properly and, and and automate that order fulfillment 
But the, the, the thing that happened was, you know, all of a sudden we went from like a thousand paid customers to 10,000, 20,000, a hundred thousand on, you know, non-paying customers that we can then, you know, funnel into our, um, into our, a, uh, a paid, paid offering. And so that was pretty wild to see, like, you know, how we went from, you know, all the work we had to do to get a thousand people to sign up for that product to all of a sudden having hundreds of thousands of people signing up in the matter of like a few months. Um, and what the power of having your, your customers and your users doing the work to, to ultimately help generate more, more leads and more customers for you because of them just using the product and providing a value add. Um, so that was pretty special. That was like the biggest thing I learned, I think. Yeah, definitely. I can be relatable to a lot of our founders here because we have a lot of marketplaces that are building for SMBs. So, so I guess, you know, going back to the, uh, you know, to the very beginning for our intro though, you know, what was the uh, founding story for, uh, for intro and, uh, what were some of the uh, first steps that you actually uh, took to start it as a marketplace? Yeah. So with intro, I mean, it all started kind of when I was like 18 years old, to be honest. Um, not, I didn't start the company there. This, the origin stories, you know, started then I, I randomly was walking down the street with a friend of mine and we were in college and she, she had learned that I was into this concept of entrepreneurship. I didn't really, to be honest, know the word entrepreneur until she taught, taught it to me because I just did these things. Um, and she's like, it sounds like those things are your, it sounds like you're an entrepreneur. So, so then a month later, you know, we're walking down the street and she pointed out this gentleman across the street from us because she had just read about him in the local newspaper. And his name is Paul Orfala, the founder of Kinko's. And she's like, that's the founder of Kinko's. And, and I'm a pretty shy guy, by the way, like at this moment, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat introverted and, and so forth. I'm a, you know, not anymore, but, uh, back then I was, and I don't know what got into me, but I decided to just like shoot my shot. And I, and I went up to Paul, I, I walked across the street, I tapped him on the shoulder and then, and I said, hi, Mr. Orfala. I, 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 my friend just told me you're the founder of Kinko's. I'm a young aspiring entrepreneur. And I was just wondering if I could ask you a few questions about entrepreneurship and he loved it. He, he, we went and sat down and, and in 15, 30 minutes, I learned more about entrepreneurship than I had ever learned before. I was so inspired by this person's story. And by the end of that conversation, I felt like he believed in me. Like, and I, you know, that's the part we don't talk about with entrepreneurship or these things. Sometimes you just need a moment of someone believing in you that, that did it before. And, and so, so I remember that moment like yesterday, like it was, it was such a defining moment for my, my, my journey, my path as an entrepreneur that I, I ended up deciding in that moment, I was like, I am going to become an entrepreneur. Like this guy believes me. I, I, I feel like I know everything now. And, and, uh, and I, and I decided to become one. So, so then years later when I, and I, and I stay in touch with Paul, um, and I would help him out. I would, I would go work, like I would go help, uh, you know, basically like, you know, serve snacks and drinks and stuff at his poker games. And he would teach me a little bit about business. And, and I was just always really respectful. I, I, I think I made him feel good as a result. And so he wanted to keep me around and, and he became like a, a, uh, like an uncle or a second father to me years later when, when I sold in, uh, sold a, you know, company to into it, he was the first person I called and, and I just thanked him, you know, and I said, you know, like, I don't know if I would have actually been able to get to this point where not for you. And he did teach me some pretty key, valuable information that, that was otherwise quite hard to, there's a lot of people that people write online, but they don't tell you the full story. And so being able to have access to someone like that was pretty impactful. So then after into it, your, you know, I, I'm, I'm super grateful for this because when you sell a company and, and you're also affiliated with a pretty well-known product, you, you know, you just get a lot more access. People invite you to more things. It's, it's interesting. And so I would be at these dinners or at these events with some of the greatest, you know, greatest people in the world and not just entrepreneurs, but you know, athletes or actors or people who are famous artists or, or whatever it may be, fashion designers or so forth. And a fun question that I like to ask these people was, how did you become great at what you do? And it's just a great conversation starter. starter. 
And so over the years, I, I started to, you know, ask these questions and I, and I, I started to build a network of folks and I was always just, I, I think I like, this is my, also my, my secret trick in life is just be super nice to everyone. Um, um, even when you have an urge to like talk a little crap about them, don't, uh, or try to refrain from that because like everyone's just doing their thing and, and, uh, everyone's, you know, life is, as as is, is hard enough as it is. So I'd rather be a little bit more of a positive light in, in people's lives than, than a negative one. And so I, I think because of that, I, you know, people wanted me around a little bit more and I was always helpful too. I never asked for anything. And so after you, you know, doing this for, you know, many, many years, I, I built up a network and, and I learned, you know, while building that network, well, you know, a lot of these folks had access to somebody, you know, whether it was one person or multiple people, sometimes in a long-term mentorship way, sometimes in a moment of time where they just met someone for, for 20 minutes and they learned something that completely changed their life. And, and it was so impactful to them. And so, so um, I, I learned that all these greats had somebody else or, or, or a group of other people that helped guide them to their greatness and that those folks were great. And so I wanted, to under, I wanted to figure out if there was a way to scale that out so that more people, it doesn't matter where you live or where you're from or, or what your situation is, build a democratized, like a, like a level playing field system that gives access to anyone so that ultimately you can have that moment that I had with Paul and, 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 and completely go down a different path that you should have always gone down and, 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 and have like real amazing impact to that you feel like you should have always been able to, to provide. And so, so that's why we built intro and, and, and that's how, that's how we kind of came up with the idea. And there's a couple other situations where I learned by just giving advice and the impact that it had on, on other businesses. Um, like the ROI on, on those businesses that it provided was pretty insane. And so I thought, wow, if you just, if, you know, this entrepreneurship thing is hard, but it doesn't have to be like that hard. And, you know, everyone thinks you have to do every part of a business, like completely new, like, or it has to be completely novel. It's just really like the idea that has to be novel, like the distribution strategies and the frameworks around that and, and how to hire people and how to manage people, like that's pretty much been the same for a while. Like some things have been modified. Um, so if you, if you just have someone that you can, you know, call up every now and then to, to ask them, Hey, what would you do in this situation? And they already built like a company worth a hundred million dollars or $500 million or, or $20 billion, you know, like chances are they're going to probably know, you know, 80 to 90% of the right answer. And if they don't, they're going to know someone else who does. And, and as a result, it's just, it's a, a total unlock and, and how to build companies. And, 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 and so that's what we wanted to do is we wanted to just really build something that, that allowed access, that allowed people to have a much higher chance of success and, and, uh, and, 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 and have their lives, uh, you know, change a little bit and, and allow them to make a dent in the world as well. Like that would be cool to have those kinds of ripple effects. Um, all right. I'm blabbling now. So you, you cut me off when you want me to. Oh, no, that's a, that's a really cool, uh, you know, story. And, uh, yeah, th thanks for sharing that with us. So I guess, you know, uh, like in the very beginning though, you know, how did you, uh, initially kind of convince like the, uh, first experts to, to join? And then, uh, as marketplaces, of course, we kind of face the uh, chicken and the egg or the kind of cold start problem. So, you know, kind of with that, you know, how did you solve for that? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it really, it's not an easy company to start. And, and to be honest, there's competitors that have popped up that have just failed. Um, and I think the biggest reason why is because the caliber of the experts, like that's really important. So <clears throat> for me, it was really my network. It was me calling friends that I have built those relationships with over many years. And like I mentioned, been just super nice to folks, been really helpful and never asked for anything. Um, and this was like my one ask. And, and so I think that was part of it. I think because we're, it started during the pandemic, people were just bored. So like the chances of them saying yes was way easier, uh, or way higher. And so, so I call these folks up and I called up Rachel Zoe, um, who's like a famous stylist and, and, you know, she's a, a family friend, um, you know, she, her, I, I know her husband really well. I know her through her husband and, 
Um, and I just asked her, I said, would other stylists that are, that are working with celebrities do this? Like, would they want to work virtually? And, and her answer was like, oh my gosh, yes. Like they make money, but not like a ton of money. So, so that was like an interesting observation. And then while I was on that call with her, she, she's like, I want to do it. Like, this sounds really fun. And I was a bit taken back by that, to be honest, because I thought she was a little bit too well known of a celebrity to, to want to do something like this. And, and, uh, and she said, no, like part of my success is I've always been willing to be more accessible than everyone else. And I did a TV show. It's like pretty, pretty, you know, uh, uh, that unlocks a lot of access into my life. Um, and so, so she was, she was down to try. And, and so we, we started it with her and then, uh, we recruited some more friends, uh, in, in the wellness world in the creator world, and then in the, in the business world. And and that's how we seeded it. And it was sometimes me begging and sometimes me just asking. But but we also made it really easy to folk for folks. We only had 15 minute sessions um early on. So it wasn't too much of a lift. It's like, hey, all you have to do is these like quick 15 minute calls. Um, you know, later on we added longer dura duration calls and and more recently we added subscriptions so you can actually work with an expert on an ongoing basis and have them as an advisor or mentor. Um, but we started with this like low lift, really easy kind of, um, uh, uh, solution for experts. And then, um, and then from there, they just had such a good experience that, that it made it easier to, to get other experts. So we would recruit experts and then it became less of a sell, um, because they, they heard about it from their friends. Um, and, and so we went from 20 experts then to like a hundred experts and to a few hundred experts. And I think once we got to 500 experts, we stopped recruiting, um, because the network effects started to kick in, especially in our, in our business category. Um, and people found out how like fun it was and how fulfilling it was. And, and for a lot of them, they don't really need the money. It's not about the money. It's, it's, I'm not going to lie and say it's not not about the money like if it feels if there's something about even if you're making like a few hundred bucks it feels good like that someone's willing to spend money for your time like they they value your time but more importantly it just it's it's and it's like really like a, a method of respect um but more importantly it's it's primarily for these like people who are worth like hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars like for them it's just a filtering mechanism it's like Who's serious enough to spend some money to come to a call? And then as a result of that monetary, you know, layer, what ends up happening is the expert really feels like they owe it to you to like, to like help you out and make sure, make sure they're providing a lot of information so they come prepared. And then the, the consumer also comes very prepared because now they have assigned a dollar amount to this time and time is money. They don't want to waste it. So, so they come really prepared with great questions. And, and as a result, you have like, you basically have this relationship where you have this expert who's like kind of up here and then this consumer. And after like two seconds of talking, because they want to be hope, both hyper efficient, they just become two equals talking about the craft that they love. And, and it just, it creates like these amazing bonds between, between both parties and it creates a great experience. And it's part of the, it is not part of it. It's like the main reason why we are just growing so much organically and why we're growing so much on the supply side, because, because experts just tell their friends about it and, and they enjoy it. And, 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 and it's, um, to them, it doesn't feel like time wasted. It feels like, all right, my, my time is a little bit limited, but I enjoy doing these. It, it brings me energy. So I want to keep doing more and I want to tell more people about it. So that's, I don't know if, uh, answer your question but no that's uh that's definitely a great to learn more about so it sounds like as far as you know on the expert side it's like a somewhat of a kind of a curated uh, supply strategy there um and uh you also mentioned as far as you know having uh, multiple categories kind of ranging from business to even you know health and wellness and interior design so i guess like kind of if we if we go back to like the you know the earlier stages how did you think about you know which categories to kind of like seed experts in and did you take like a more of like a broad approach and then narrow in or yeah yeah we we go broad and then narrow in on what works and so for us like the business category works the the all all the categories work it's just about which ones are the easiest and work the best right now and so 
as a startup, you only have so much time and resources. So, so instead of working on things that get you, you know, two dollars for every dollar you invest, you should work on the things that get you five dollars for every dollar that you invest. Um, whether that's marketing dollars or time, um, uh, you know, time related to your salary. So, so for us, like the business and, and home category work the best, and and so and even then, we still focus a bit more on the business side. Um, because that's just working exceptionally well. No, it definitely seems like it. So you have a, a, a lot of experts, as I mentioned to you before we uh, started recording, um, that are past group chat uh, guests like Spencer Razkoff from uh, Zillow, Nick Kuzar, uh, Kevin Gibbon, and uh, uh, you know quite quite a few others. And uh, something else, I guess, worth noting is that um, you know a lot of the uh, experts are sharing on social, right? And so helping kind of build awareness and uh, and, and driving traffic. So is that uh, one of the kind of like key parts as far as uh, your growth? I would say, I, I wouldn't say it's like a key, key part, but it's, it's definitely helpful. You always want to be like authentic about, you know, who's going to book these people. So, so where are people engaging with them organically? Some people are just, you know, you know, like maybe it's like through a podcast or something and, and, uh, they have a big podcast audience and them just talking about it is interesting. Other times people are going to LinkedIn and, or Twitter and following them there and um or on linkedin like they're searching for that person specifically so if we're going to add a a link or or some sort of post that allows people to you know build awareness of of, of their intro links so that they can book them that's that's interesting um but a lot of times too like you have to remember let's say i follow um you know you know so he bloom and i follow him and of all of his million followers, I probably, you know, when he posts something, probably like a hundred thousand or 200,000 of them see of his actual followers, see it. And then probably another like 300,000 of people who are not in his network see it. Um, let's say I wanted to learn how to, you know, become a kind of like business creator, um, and learn that business. I, I, in that moment, I might have that interest, but I might not have that intent. Like I'm not ready to do it. And so he might post something, I might see it. And the information that post connects to this idea that I have in my head of, of, I want to learn how to do this. Um, and if it does perfectly, I'm, I might jump, but I also might not be ready. Whereas with ads, uh, you know, we can show his ad all day long. And so maybe day one, someone doesn't see his ad, maybe day 20, someone, you know, someone sees his ad as well and they're not ready. But by day 45, like the moment they're like, God, I really want to become, you know, a, a, a creator around business topics. I wonder who's the best. And then they see an ad for Sahil. It helps, it helps get them right, you know, right in that moment. Um, and so ads do really help, help our business quite a bit. Um, but, but, the organic, um, I would say organic, to be honest, is, is more important versus the expert led growth. Um, because, you know, if you build a great experience, like I, you know, people used to, by the way, people used to say this stuff to me and I just like, let it, you know, kind of go over my head. Um, it's like, Oh sure. Yeah. Just build a great experience and like all of your problems will be solved. But I have firsthand experience now when you build a great experience that does something magical that was pretty hard before, um, then then the word of mouth is pretty pretty significant. I think the best example of that is like OpenAI. I mean, they didn't they did zero marketing and they hit, you know, I think it's like two billion in revenue in their first couple couple years of going, you know, uh since going live with with uh, Chat GPT and 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 their other products and like Sora and the whole thing, it's just all crazy. Like it's so vastly, you know, beyond anything we've ever experienced that every everyone was telling everyone about it. And as a result, um, the product um, did all the selling and 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 generated that revenue. Those are uh, really good examples. So I, I feel like uh, you and I could go on for uh, quite some time and I realize I'm uh, actually getting questions from our founders here. So I want to make sure we can uh, save time for the uh, group Q&A. Um, but, you know, before we do, though, so you, of course, uh, have raised, uh, you know, from some pretty awesome uh, investors, of course, that uh, that back intro on um, like 776 and uh, A16Z. So, you know, what has the uh, fundraising journey been like? 
Uh, fundraising journey for this one was way different than any other business I've ever had. I mean, this one was easy. I'm not gonna lie. Like, and, um, the, I mean, with lettuce, it was brutal. Like building like an ERP order management system slash supercharged accounting product. People were like, like, that's not cool. That's not sexy. And you want to do it for small businesses when this was before, you know, you know, when, you know, when you built for small businesses, like people thought you were crazy and you like, you should have, you should just be building for enterprise. And so, so we did that now and now it's, now it's cool to build for small businesses because they, they understand it and they've seen success stories because of it. Uh, and I'm talking about investors, but, um, but with lettuce, it was brutal. And, and I learned what worked and what didn't and, and so forth. But w- with this company, it's a little unfair because I did QuickBooks before. Um, so that gives me pretty good credibility. But then at the same time, I'm friends with a lot of VCs now. And I like, I now, I just ask them questions on how, uh, why did they invest in one company versus the other? And, and I learned how they think and I, and I, and I, I learned how to be empathetic of like their position. And I think that that's the, that's the biggest takeaway that I can give is, is VCs, like we all think of them as like these people who are like, you have tons of money and they, they're the ones who like make or break our career. But in reality, they're just representing a bunch of rich people, um, LPs or, or, you know, institutions like colleges or pension funds or whatever. And they're terrified of like not performing well, you know, like they're constantly sweating of like, am I, is this going to be the last moment of my career? So I, I got to back the best companies possible. And so once you realize that you, you realize like, they're just, they just want to make sure they're, they're going to have a job in, in, in 10 years or so. Um, because once they're done, if they don't perform on VC, like you're kind of done, like it's pretty it's, it's not, it's not a glorious or or glamorous thing. So, so for them, once you understand that you then want to understand what are the frameworks in which they think to build a, to back a, uh, a successful company. So for them, they care about a great team. They care about a, a market that's, that's big and also growing because it's just easier to build a company that in a market that's growing versus a market that's pretty big and, and stale. Uh, they care about um, are you actually solving a problem uh, versus just coming up with some silly idea uh, um, that's that you think is a problem uh, solver. So find a problem that people have and create a solution for it. They want to understand like what you know which audience are you going after and does that audience resemble you in some way? Because like if I was building a product for you know, soccer moms, you know, of kids between the ages of 10 and, 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 and 17. Well, I'm not, a, I'm not a woman. So that's pretty hard. I'm, I'm not a mom either. And I don't have kids that are in that, in that, in that, in that age range. And also like, I don't play soccer. So, so the idea is like, you want to pick something that like actually is a problem for yourself as well, because you're going to more likely understand that problem. Um, do you have some sort of unique distribution strategy or do you have some sort of distribution strategy that actually works? Um, so it's one thing to build a product, but you know, how are you going to get in front of a lot of people at the right time so that they use or purchase your products? Um, and then like a few other things, but for the most part, if you, if you think about your business in that way and you, and you don't think about it after building your product, but you think about it while you're building a product, what ends up happening is you're you're going to actually end up building a better business, and then you, you, you need to be able to perform and show some traction based on these things, so that ultimately they have a bit of a vote of confidence that all right, I'm willing to take a bet on this because it's not going to leave me without a career in ten years. It's, it has a higher chance of succeeding than other companies. Um, and so because I did that, I I built a product. We we had live experts on there. We had a live product. We had like 50 K in sales, um, in like the first, first two, three months of going live with our alpha beta. And, and so, and then I did the QuickBooks thing. And so because of all that, you know, it was a pretty far round and, and, and moved, you know, quite quickly. Keep in mind too, this was like 2021. So it was a pretty crazy funding environment. Um, now, like even, even today, like, like when we go raise some more capital, like I have to just be even more deliberate and I have to like make sure 
there are no red flags with our business um, because it's not not a similar funding environment to 2021. It's it's much much more difficult to raise capital from what I hear. And so I just want to go into a pitch and and have people kind of like when I leave the room say, "Holy shit, that's they like figured out everything." And this this guy right here, like and his team is they are the real deal. Like we would be crazy not to invest. Like that's the kind of response I want um, versus having the relationship of of entrepreneur VC of uh, you know please like help me like come up with my, you know, back my dreams and give me the money to make my dreams come true. Like they don't want to back that. They want to back the team who is just an absolute machine and they, and doing really well and, and firing fire on all cylinders so that, so that they can, they can, once again, we have to be empathetic of their situation so that they can take their, their a capital that they invest and 10 exit, 20 exit or 30 exit so that once again, they'll have a job in 10 years. Um, and once you think about it that way, you 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 kind of don't look at VCs as this like big evil thing, um, uh, but more so just people uh, who are just trying to do their thing, just the same way you're trying to do your thing. Uh, and and once you respect that, uh, they'll respect you as well. No, I mean you know you mentioned uh, so many great points and uh, tips here that are going to be uh, helpful for founders, and I'm I'm really glad you also too highlighted the importance of distribution because that's something we've been uh, talking about a lot more recently as well. So uh, looks like we got 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 a few founders that are raised their hand. Hey, uh, Dimitri, you had a uh, question uh, you uh, sent me as far as uh, about pricing. Do you want want to come on? Your explanation of signaling is just fantastic as a way to kind of get attention um, and allocate attention of these kind of high valuable experts to exactly the folks that need them. So I'm curious how that translates into how you price. How do you set prices? Are they dynamic? If it's a recurring kind of consultation, how do you kind of deal with the disintermediation of the piece of that as well? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like the pricing of the experts, like how much they charge. Yeah. Like how do you set the price? Or do you let them do it? Yeah. Well, it's, uh, uh, it's a self-serve platform for the most part. Yeah. We we do provide a concierge team to like help, like what we call it expert success, but uh, help guide them on how to set up their profile and how to think about getting customers and so forth and how to price themselves. But they're, they're in full control. So it's, it's all up to them. And They'll probably like what I notice is they look at other experts that are similar to them on the platform and they'll price similar. Um, generally, what we found is when people price themselves below like 300 bucks, they just get too many experts, they get too many bookings and it's it becomes too intense and it's it's like this could become a full time job for them. Um, so a lot of them will change it up to like four or five hundred dollars and it'll, the prices, the, the number of bookings will drop. But like for some folks, like you know, like Spencer, Spencer doesn't really want to charge seven hundred fifty bucks. He he's donating it all to charity, but he just gets too many bookings at at anything below that. So uh, and it makes sense because he's he's the co-founder of Zillow. So so um and and everyone, everyone knows what that product is. So so just it's all up to them with the subscription. I I personally like. Like because it's like a beta product, we've only allowed thirteen experts now to to set up a subscription tier, um, and it's just blown out, like blown away all of our expectations. Um, I think the prices that they're charging right now it might seem expensive to some folks, but it's honestly so freaking cheap compared to what you're getting. Um, like the best way to think about it is if you wanted to hire a, a full-time C-suite executive, um, of like a pretty high caliber. Um, and this is for companies that are doing like, you know, a few million dollars, like let's say you're doing $5 million or more in revenue and, uh, you're ready to hire someone to take you to the next level. Realistically, you're, you're looking at paying them like a minimum of like 300 K a year in salary all the way up to like, I don't know, like 500 to 700 K in salary. So, so let's just say at a minimum, like 25 K a month. Uh, and that's not even including all the taxes and health insurance and all the other stuff you have to pay. Um, and the kind of person you can get, they're going to be good, but they're in no way ever going to be as good as Spencer Raskoff, the guy who built a $20 billion company or at, at the height 50 billion. Um, and so, 
And so, you know, one or two hours a month with Spencer will completely destroy, uh, you know, a full-time C-suite exec at your company because he just knows so much more and he is on a totally different level um, that, that it, 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 you know, I, I if you wanted to hire a Spencer, like, to your company and he actually would say yes, like, you're looking at paying him, like, multi-million dollars a year kind of thing. Um, so to be able to get him for like three grand a month or four grand a month, I don't even know what his prices are. It's like something like that. It's, it's, it's bonkers. Um, and, and so, and so that's part of the reason it's been so successful and there's just a lot of people keep using it. Um, and he, he keeps having to like open up more spots to, to, to make room for folks. But, um, same with Nikita, like just to give you guys an example, like Nikita has like quite a few subscribers now um in terms of like this one-on-one -on -one capacity and four not not one not two not three but four of his subscribers and his customers on intro they've hit the top 10 in the app store because of the feedback and advice they gave him and they actually executed on it like that's like the holy grail of of like anyone who's an app. like i've never hit top 10 and i want to do that so so uh so that, that's pretty impressive. And the ROI on that is just, is, it's profound. Like, like just to give you some context, like, um, um, Scopely would spend $30 million to, to basically boost their apps, uh, over X number of months. I mean, like a lot of money to make sure their app gets to the number one, because once it gets into the number one for enough time, it sticks there for a while. So their games would just perform exceptionally well. And so that's, that was their big kind of like aha moment is we just need to raise a lot of capital to get these games that work all the way to the top and keep them there for a while because then um, they'll stick around and it'll become one of the most popular games creating a multi-billion dollar franchise. So, so, so that's the kind of like ROI, like, you, you know, you, you're, you're, you're getting. So I personally think it's super cheap. Like I, I subscribe to a couple of people, but I won't say who yet. Those are a pr pretty incredible uh, kind of uh, case studies or testimonials. So, for you. Cool. So, uh, let's see. Hey, uh, Nyoshi, do you uh, want to come on? Hi. Um, so, I have a question on kind of quality management. And have you had to think about managing for low quality, whether on the expert side or the booker side? And, you know, if experts aren't getting kind of the same rate of, of requests, kind of thinking about do you weed them out or, or how do you how do you kind of manage um, that systematically? Not yet, but we don't really need to do yet because we still approve everyone who gets into the marketplace. Um, so, so like everyone who's getting approved into the marketplace for the most part is pretty high quality. And then for folks who who like we would have normally like not even looked at their application because they're just we have like a ten thousand person wait list right now. Um, we have a thousand experts live. So. So, um, so sometimes we just miss things or some, sometimes they're like, oh, that person's great, but not yet. Um, you know, like they'll, they get access to our booking tool and they can use our tool to basically facilitate their own sessions. And if they perform a certain amount, then we'll automatically invite them into our marketplace. Um, so it's the opposite. It's like, we, we kind of make it a little bit more exclusive, but everyone could use our tool. Um, and then if you perform well, you get an invite in, um, uh, if you're not someone who's like well-known, um, and, and as a result, you end up getting more bookings for the most part, if someone doesn't get a booking in a month, like no one, no one churns. Cause they like, they've tried it for a few times. They like it. And then, and then we, we encourage them to, to just do a little bit more work to, to get more bookings on their own, because then they just start to rank higher in the marketplace and then they start to get more bookings. So, and I think, I think we're still early where people don't fully know that. Um, but at some point when you become like a pretty big marketplace, people, you know, like there's all these strategies around Facebook and Google and, and Airbnb and, and, and so forth. So like, like we'll get, like, I hope we get to that point. I think we will. I think we, all signs are, are, are showing that we'll, we'll, will be a successful company, but, but, um, but, uh, but I think we'll get to that point where there's going to be like, you know, 
communities and groups of people who are just talking about strategy on how to get more bookings and 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 get more customers for his for control. Oh, someone talked about like this uh like basically people going off platform. Um, we have a pricing model that like you know that like helps with that. So uh, after someone subscribes for X number of months, the our take rate just goes lower, lower, lower. So that way, um, um, you know, people do that less. We're also pretty communicative of, or or pretty transparent about what our costs are to get that customer for them. And we like show that in their dashboard. So we say to them like, hey, if we got you this booking through page channel, we're actually in the red right now. So we lost money. Um, and if you were to do this on your own, this is how much it would cost to acquire that customer. And so like, we'll make our money back after two or three or four months. Um, so like, like because we actually like share that information, like, like no other platform does that they they they're like oh this seems fair then like this doesn't seem like you're trying to gouge me in pricing um and then um and then the second thing is like we're we're just building a solution that's much better than anything else out there that i think if you have like one subscriber or one customer there's a chance that you might take them off but once you have like three or four or five it starts to become a little bit of a headache to do it off platform um and so so like how can we build a product that is just so substantially like it's just substantially better that 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 you're actually doing yourself a disservice by going off platform yeah thanks for sharing with us on that so we're gonna try to squeeze in uh one last question here if we can hey uh michael do you uh, want to come on because i know you uh, raised your hand earlier yes thank you i am a big fan of intro and i think what i love best about it is the simplicity of the interface for the demand side it's just beautiful my question for you is, um, right now, it seems like you go in and you browse the listings and you find the person that looks like the right fit for you. Do you have plans for an experience where, as a consumer, you describe what you're looking for and then Intro's algorithm matches you to the best expert? Or is that just going to just confuse the user experience? No, no, you nailed it. Um, that'd be cool if you could just go search like a question and then and then it just highlights which experts would be able to answer that question. So probably, you know, realistically, like we'll start doing stuff like that next year. So we're always uh, talking about as far as, you know, marketplaces, how uh, kind of like open search and discovery it is versus kind of the role sometimes marketplaces play with matching. So it's cool to hear. Keep in mind too, you know, when you're building these things, Everyone thinks they have to do all these bells and whistles and everything, but like you just got to get the core experience down right, and then all the other stuff you can have kind of like like if I were to rate intro right now, I would give it a B minus as a whole because there's so many things that are missing, and and our team of like X number of engineers just can't get to all of them, you know, fast enough. So so as we hire more people, we'll be able to get to to more to more of that, but. You know, there's just so many little things that we can do that gets it to a a, a plus experience, but that's realistically like going to take years and years. So instead of having this like, you know, innovators dilemma or or this this I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, but it's like instead of like having this like paralysis of of I can't push something out until it's perfect. Um, you you want to get something out there because you're. Like I mentioned before, you're never going, to, even the best product people in the world, savants at, at product, never get it right 100% of the time. They get it right probably like 40% of the time. So so like you want to put something out there, you want to hear and see and feel um, what everyone is asking and, and, and suggesting and then, you know, using that as a as a, a mechanism to, to then figure out what needs to improve in the product, what needs to change or what needs to be added or what needs to be taken out. Yeah, no, that's a, definitely a great uh, last tip and a way to wrap things up. So, Lord, I, we really appreciate, you know, taking the time to join us here today. This is a really awesome chat and a great to learn more about not only uh, your earlier experience at Lettuce, but now more about what you're building with that intro. And uh, as Michael mentioned, a lot of us are uh, big fans here. You know, so actually I actually had a one last question for you. We can make this uh, quick, though, before we wrap things up. And that's if you could uh, go right back to before you started that intro, uh, you know, what would you uh, tell yourself about marketplaces specifically? Well, like we got, we got certain things wrong, but we also got a lot of things right. And it was exactly, to be honest, like what I said, like, cause with my first company, we were just way more, we, we didn't get things out quickly and we, we, 
you know, plus we were also dealing with like like a fintech solution, so so it's like a little bit more. You have to be like a little bit more buttoned up with that stuff. Um, but it, it, it's just you know, get something out there just so that you can start to learn and and hear what your customers have to say. Yeah, no, certainly got got a lot of uh, head nods. And then uh, last but not least, time for a quick plug. Uh, where can we uh, keep up with you at? Oh, where to keep up with me? Uh, I'm on Twitter mostly. Uh, so. So it's just at Rad Mobrem, R A A D M O B R E M. Also follow, like, use intro. Uh, yeah, it's use intro. Um, cause we, we post a lot of like educational content and stuff. Um, and then, and then I honestly, I'm going to plug my business. Like, I have no problem like asking everyone now to like pay for our product because I am so confident now in the ROI that you'll get. Um, Publicly, like we say, like if you can get a 10x or more, you know, greater ROI, like it's worth it. I think people are just getting substantially higher like ROI than that. We appreciate it. This this is great. So th thanks everyone for joining in for the uh, great questions as well.